Hi, this is Janet Fitch, and it is noon on Wednesday, so that means it is Writing Wednesday when I answer your writing questions, um, talk about craft, talk about um, literature, talk about um, the writer in the world and your everyday stuff. Um, welcome. So it is. I have a bunch of questions today from various uh, uh, of my correspondents uh, on the interwebs. Uh, but if you have questions uh, for me today, put them in the comments and I will be happy to answer them. And if you ever want to have your question be the topic of a Writing Wednesday, uh, write to me through my website, JanetFitchWrites.com. So today uh, we're going to talk about, uh, I have a bunch of questions, so um, let's see. The first one I'd say is, um, What are the signs that a novel is bad? Um, everybody would have their own take on this. When you open a novel and you start reading it, or when you're in the store or in the library and you take a book off the shelf and you start looking through it. Hi, Wendy. How do you know uh, that that's a novel that's bad? Uh, and bad is often... Um, we can say maybe not to your taste, which is knowing yourself and what you don't like in a book, but then there's just not very good writing. Um, uh, so that's first. For me, I can look through a novel. Um, the first thing I do is I go to a dialogue scene. And is the dialogue scene a uh, stripped dialogue, meaning it's just the... Uh, the um, chat marching down the page, no landscape, no th thinking, no gestures, no nothing else but the lips moving. Uh, I can pretty much uh, by that point eliminate most of the bad writing right there because dialogue is the hardest thing to write. Uh, so if the writer isn't writing um, dialogue that incorporates the other parts of fiction writing, uh, you, can t you can pretty much surmise that uh, they're not giving a lot of thought to the rest of the book either. Um, with the exception when the dialogue is, that talk is really sharp, um, then that's a, you know, I, I, that also tells you something about how that book is going to be written. Uh, and if the dialogue is sharp enough to carry it, uh, say Elmore Leonard, usually that doesn't write a lot of description. Uh, he's usually pretty short on gesture, description, etc. But the, the uh, dialogue, the utterance is so clever, witty, moves, no cliches, um, characterization in the dialogue, um, million dollar lines all the way through, um, doesn't bore us, no straight man lines, what do you mean by that, etc. Um, that I'll give somebody like Elmore Leonard a pass, uh, that is just such good writing. But generally I'm looking for thinking when I open a book and start reading. I want not just what happens, but I'm looking for a, a writer who moves to the to larger thoughts about the world, who extrapolates from what's right in front of them to something um, more about the human experience. So what So what are the signs that a novel is bad? Is that the person, the character, uh, point of view character, eats dinner and thinks about dinner and talks about dinner? Um, that it's all kind of on the same level. 
uh, that there's not much internals. You can kind of look at it and you see paragraphs are very short and there's a lot of, t of talk. There's a lot of chat, uh, meet and greet, um, rather than conflict lines. Um, but it just seems very thin. Um, unless it is instantly sucks you in. You know, there's lightly written minimal kind of work that is riveting. So you can tell whether it's grabbing your attention immediately and sucking you in and all you wanted to do was see whether it was something you wanted to read and suddenly you're like, oh my God, this is so amazing. <laughs> um, so with any rule, you know, when I talk about writing, um, it's the principle that I want you to kind of think about rather than thinking of it as a rule and you must do this. It's something to keep in mind. It's, something, it's a rule of thumb. But if somebody does something really well or you're doing something really well, that absolutely contradicts everything that I say. Um, awesome. You know, it, what works, what works, works. But um, generally, these are things that don't work. The, the strict dialogue, uh, no atmosphere, no landscape, no gestures. Um, characters aren't thinking. Uh, if they think, they only think about the thing that is right in front of them. There's no peripheral thinking. There's no personality in the thinking. Um, to me, that that's a sign the novel is bad. Um, um, Let's see, uh, here's a question. Uh, Malaika has a question. Uh, when it comes to, is it using, uh, I have a nitpicky question when it comes for questions. Is using a Pantone color, Caribbean blue, a cliche now? Uh, I've used it, a student of mine has used it, I've seen it in writing. Well, if you've seen it, see if you can find a blue that is more indicative of your character's circumstance, where they're at now, um, of their environment, of their story, of their concerns. You know, if you're in New York and you're longing for home in Martinique and you see somebody wearing a Caribbean blue, um, dress or shirt, you know, why don't you be more specific, you know, where in the Caribbean, you know, um, specificity is good coming up, but come up with something unique, you know, there's no reason to use, um, Panatone's, Panatone, Pantone's, uh, uh, color palette, because there's a million words, ways to describe a color. And uh, we've talked about that. So reach, reach, reach further. See what you can do. Um, so let's see what else happens here. Um, so what else, what are signs that a novel is bad? Like, what do you guys find? Any cliches whatsoever? Anything you've heard before? Any cheap combination of words? Um, uh, underexplored things, uh, but any any cliches, and you can tell that it's uh, it's not good. Um, those thin paragraphs, you know, we're just it's just skimming along the top and moving on, and skimming along the top and moving on. It, it never goes down into a thought or a situation the way a paragraph should open up. Um, that's a, that's a sure sign. Here's another question. This is a, a point of view question. I just taught a, a big weekend workshop on point of view. So that this is an interesting question. How can I put the unconscious body language of a point of view character in first person? 
I want to use subtext using the character's gestures, but it's hard to put into practice when in the first person. How can I approach this? Well, you have discovered the downside of first person, is that it's very difficult to see the protagonist. Uh, a protagonist generally does not notice their own gestures. They notice the other person's gestures. Uh, if this presents an ongoing problem in your work, consider writing it in the third person, and you'll discover that you can use, if those unconscious body language is important um, to you, think about third person. Um, but if you have other reasons you want to do first and you um, are really committed to it, um, how do you describe what a character is doing in a way that they would notice or it would come to their attention because they're your point of view character? You know, mirrors aren't going to do that. Uh, uh, if it's an unconscious gesture like... Um, pulling at the ear when they're upset. You know, you're not going to notice that. Your mother's going to notice that. Another character is going to notice that. Your wife or husband is going to go, you know, are you upset? Oh, no, no. You know, why do you ask? Well, because you always pull your ear when uh, you're getting angry. And then the character can think, I never, uh, I know my mother's, you know, people have told me that for years. I never notice it. Um, but I was getting really angry <laughs> or something like that. Somebody can tell the character uh, that there's a gesture that they've, you know, and call attention to it. Um, uh, you know, my child flinched and I realized that I had raised my hand without even being aware of it. Um, so you work it through another character. But in general, third is better for this kind of thing. You notice the other person's gesture, uh, not your own. Um, let's see. For first person, Wendy says, perhaps they intentionally do something, turned away, coughed incessantly, picked at her nails. Yeah, it's a but this is an unconscious thing that the author wants to bring to the attention of the first person character. Yeah, Linda says, you know you have a tell when you lie. That's what somebody else would tell the, the, um, the protagonist. So you can work it in in first. Uh, or they see, a, they see it in a photograph of themselves. They didn't even realize that they were doing it. Um, okay, here's another question. Uh, why are adverbs considered evil? I keep hearing eliminate adverbs as a piece of writing advice. Okay, well, this is a simple one. Um, people who do not choose strong verbs will try to shore it up with an adverb. He strolled angrily. He walked angrily. Well, there's a verb, stomp. He stomped out of the door. So he didn't have to walk angrily. You know, we, we pick a stronger verb. Um, so an adverb, it's not that they're evil. It's that they're, they're a sign that you're, you haven't found a strong enough verb. And adjectives, I don't have anything wrong with adjectives, but ask yourself, is there a stronger noun that can pick up some of that, you know, what an adjective will, uh, will supply, you know, um, you know, a little mouse, you know, a mouseketeer, uh, you know, you don't necessarily, if you could find a noun that will pick up the meaning of that adjective, then you don't need it. 
So, you know, we're always looking for the stronger words, especially the verbs. So they're not evil, they're just a tell that, speaking of tells, that your verb especially needs uh, to be strengthened. Um, all right, here's another one um, from Lance. Uh, how did you learn to create your own fictional titles? Oh, titles, it's either the first thing that comes, either no right away, or it comes right at the end. Um, how do you find a title that fits your book? Um, I had a friend who, Donald Raleigh, writer, a wonderful writer, who um, said if you go to... Uh, a, the page in your book that's exactly three quarters of the way through, your title will be on that page. I don't know if that's true or not, but what it means is around the time where your most intense pressure on the characters and, and themes are starting to emerge, what this thing is about really starts to emerge uh, as you uh, approach the final section of the book. That if you, uh, that the issues of the book will emerge, and by going to those pages, you might just find your title. Um, but I certainly use titles, you know, song lyrics, poetry, the Bible, Shakespeare, you know, uh, just a combination of words that picks up without giving anything away, you know, the, the mystery of the black clock, you know, where do you think the note was? <laughs> okay, let's like give that up. But something that seems to resonate with the themes of the book, the locale, um, often it comes late and you just make huge lists and then you pick 10 and then you ask you know all kinds of people where you, you know what do you think which do you like the best uh, which can you remember see if they can remember it in two days remember those that list you know was there any, any title you can remember no i don't remember a single one of them bad sign <laughs> um Yeah, somebody can, Yael was talking about that stomp, you know, if you want to leave angrily, well, saunter is more a casual thing, so that, that has its own mood. Um, so Alicia was saying, titles are Angel's Cry and Kimono Man. Contradictory titles and high concept, not revealing anything. Learn that from Hollywood development execs. And then ask people three days later, do you remember the name of my novel? You know, if it sticks, that's good. If your agent or your editor or, you know, your five closest friends cannot remember the name, that's not a good sign. <laughs> uh, Let's see if there's anything. Okay, next question. So titles are fun. And often, you know, people will change the title and everybody will remember the title that it was before they changed it. You know, that's a, that's a sad, <laughs> that's a sad thing. I, so Jane has a question. I have a question about antagonists. Do you think a story can have an antagonist that is purely internal? So, you know, you're your own antagonist, uh, some aspect, uh, or is that force more effective embodied in a character? Um, no, I think that, that the, instead of saying a, an antagonist, which is usually means a character, um, that, that your protagonist has a conflict, your, your protagonist has a, um, an internal conflict, which is where the conflict of the book is going to arise. Most, um, you know, I can say um, 
best example is Lord Jim, um, where uh, somebody who has always thought he would be heroic when he was a kid anyway, thought he would be heroic and was just waiting for heroic uh, in, an incident to happen that he could be heroic. And actually when there was an incident like that, he did absolutely panicked and did absolutely the worst thing. And, you know, many people died. And the rest of his life, the book follows him through the rest of his life. Um, and this guilt is he's always working against it. He's always trying to figure out how do you live with that kind of guilt and try to make up for it or try to not think about it or, you know, make a life, you know, go to the ends of the world where people don't know who you are. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a, a, a wonderful source of conflict. Um, But also embodied in a character, you know, that crime and punishment. I mean, Raskolnikov feels very guilty about having murdered the landlady, although he told himself that he wouldn't, that he's living out the Nietzschean concept of the, uh, of the Ubermensch. Um, he feels, but then there's also a policeman who is a, a detective who is uh, after him. And so that's his antagonist. So there's two, you know, there's the exterior manifestation of that interior guilt. Um, and there could even be a novel in which the external antagonist is actually a projection of the internal guilt, which is interesting too for a psych psychological novel. Um, Here's one. I think this has kind of elements of a fan fiction problem, but maybe not. How do I get permission to use a fictional character that's not mine from a movie to use in my book? Can I just say at the beginning that the character is not mine and say whose it is? Well, these are two questions, I think. There's a legal question you know, if you want to write a novel using, um, you know, Iron Man or something. Um, no, you cannot write a novel about Iron Man. I'm sure that is copyrighted up the yin yang. Um, I do not think that uh, if you use such a character that that's going to be uh, legally um, a good thing for you. Um, I say don't try to get permission and don't, um, if you want to say write a, a novel using um, say Scarlett O'Hara, The Wind Done Gone, uh, uh, which was Gone with the Wind told from the point of view of one of the one of the enslaved people on the plantation, um, let's see how she managed that. Um, that that comes to mind, and my guess is that you would not use the actual names, but you would you would develop a. Um, similar did anybody read the wind done gone um it's uh i my guess is that she would um rename so scarlet o'hara might be you know uh vermilion mckay you know and everybody knows who it is uh they just changed the names uh wind done gone um so this was in an alternative account of the story of Gone with the Wind. Um, the Wind Done Gone it tells the story of one of her slaves, Sonara, in the same time period and events. Um, so there's Sonara, Mammy, Other, R. Uh, the Other is the daughter of the planter and the lady. So that's Scarlet. And then R is the husband, 
R, Rhett Butler, R. So she's getting around it by not naming, having the same names. But because we're very familiar with the story, everybody gets that level uh, of what they're talking about. So Linda says, tons of fan fiction is written about characters not in the public domain, so it must be okay somehow. Fan fiction is written for the fun of writing it, and I don't think very much of it gets published. There might be separate laws for fan fiction. I don't know. You'd have to, you'd have to investigate it. It's not something that would ever occur to me to write straight off. You know, if I wanted to write, um, you know, say I fell in love with Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I'm a big Gano Reeves fan. So I want to write about Ted. I'm not going to call him Ted. <laughs> I'm going to change everything to the point that I know who it is. But nobody else is going to know. All people will know is it's kind of in the same universe as that. Um, so I, I will always suggest changing things substantially so that there is not a legal problem. You don't have to ask permission. You just go ahead and change enough that R is Red Butler and the uh, and other is Scarlet and uh, uh, etc. But uh, The Wind Ungone, there are a lot of books that are retellings of classic stories if they're mythical they can use the names I mean you can write about uh, Achilles and Odysseus and stuff as characters and Homer's not going to sue you because he's been dead for 3,000 years but if the author or his family are still alive um you are not going to get past even, you're not even going to get into publication because the, the um, publishers uh, aren't going to take on that kind of a legal situation. So pseudonym, pseudonym, pseudonym. Change those names. Uh, okay, let's see what else we got. All right. How does one go about writing a novel with only one character who is completely alone for the entire story. Now, this is a wonderful... Oh, Meredith Meyer says there's a lot of information about fan fiction legalities online. Very good. Uh, the author has the right to ask works to be removed. Interesting. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Meredith says go online, and there's lots of, of info about fan fiction. Very cool. You know, fan fiction generally is done for the love of, for the love of it, and uh, the publication usually doesn't enter into it. There might be like sites that, oh, you know, that you can post, but a can a publisher isn't going to touch that with a ten foot pole. Um, they're not going to fight with George Martin or whoever's character uh, you've chosen. Uh, or the Joyce estate, or whoever. Um, so let's see, what was that one again? Oh, uh, how does one go about writing a novel with only one character who's completely alone for the entire story? Um, these will be works that will can have a lot of observation, nature. Um, if you look at Desolation Angels, that's Kerouac up in a tower. Uh, as a fire spotter for a good piece of a 400 page novel. Uh, Ava by Carol Mazo. I, I just taught a point of view class and used that. Uh, I love that book. Um, which is um, a person in a hospital bed dying. It's all internal. In your internal world, there are people. Your internal world is fully populated. So there's no reason to worry about having a novel that has only one character because it's going to have a full cast of characters because whoever your protagonist is, had a mother, had a father maybe, uh, had 
people in their lives, had events in their lives, attended school, had a job, um, lived in the world, presumably. Um, so there are all kinds of ways that you can write. I wouldn't even call that a problem, having a, a, a protagonist and nobody else in the present story of the book. Uh, yes, you can absolutely write about animals, you know, somebody lives as solitary, there's lots of, there's a fine tradition of that in fiction. Um, there is a book by David Markson uh, called, I believe, Wittgenstein's Mistress is the last person in the world. But she has memory. So it's, it's not a problem. The physical world still exists and memory still exists. You have enough to write an entire novel based on that. So I say go through, go to it. Do it. Um, now here is the main question of the day. Um, when writing a novel, how do you fill in the middle if you only have fresh ideas for beginning and end? That is a wonderful question, which applies to everyone. If you're lucky enough to have a beginning and end, usually you have only one or the other, <laughs> and you have to figure out the other one. Um, the I would say you have a beginning, you have a beginning, and you have an ending. You. I would be thinking about how would you get from the beginning to the ending, right? Um, usually there's a, a marked change in the protagonist between the beginning and the end, right? You start out as a spoiled brat, orphan, spoiled brat, um, stuck in a situation, you know, where you're a ward of some distant relation living in the moors in Yorkshire, say. Just for example. And you want to end it with this uh, girl uh, feeling the love and security of her family, a new family, a new land, a new self, a blah, blah, blah. So how then you're thinking of situations that would maybe shake her brattiness a little bit or put pressure on the brattiness in the beginning, putting pressure on the brattiness, letting her act it out and then maybe have that not turn out so well for her where she starts to maybe think, maybe I, I shouldn't be as big of a brat. It's sort of giving me some problems and and then moving in, you know, when the, there's a big fire, there's, uh, um, it scorches the mitochondrial layer, which is the sort of fungal, mushroomy part of the soil that holds water and lets things start to grow. And uh, life, it's the basis of, it supports life uh, in the soil, right? So after fire, First, the mitochondrial layer starts growing from the edges, and then little sprouts of grass and stuff start seeding in that layer, and it begins to grow from the outside in towards the center until the edges meet. And I think that that's what would happen if you had the beginning and the ending, is you'd start saying how do they grow together you know where you know you take two states that are very different obviously if they're not different you didn't need the book <laughs> so the two states that are very different wherever you got to if you see that really clearly which i've never started with an ending but you know if you say you have the beginning and the ending i believe you and then you start saying, well, okay, what had to change from the opening statement? What had to change to get to the ending? The brat had to see the error of her ways. Well, how does that happen? What's a scene in which a bratty person can start to notice that, oh, 
you know, this is problematic. Or maybe see another bratty person and not like what they see in the other person. And then go, oh, well, hmm, I guess we'll do that too. You don't even say it. You know, you just have them, uh, you know, thinking, God, that kid's a total brat. And the reader goes, hmm, yeah, <laughs> and you too, honey. Um, and working towards the change that you see in the ending. So you want a beginning and ending that are basically opposites, right? Um, and then allow, or at least very, very different, um, and then allow them to grow together, thinking how did they get from here to here. Um, so what shifts, what are the smaller shifts that happen in between? Um, and I think in terms of the emotion, the, the psychological content, uh, and then you think about scenes that will hold those changes or provoke those changes. So always go with character, always go with the character and the internal changes, changes of belief about the world and themselves, look for that, then what events would cause that to, to come to bear. Hey, Pat. Um, so Ruthie says, my ending moved to the beginning and the middle changed accordingly. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. So was it circular or did it, um, did you just take the ending and make that the start and then it ended somewhere else? So this is Ruthie Marlin A. She's talking about her book, Agave Blues. I mean, there can be circular, you know, circular stories that start in one place and then you see the journey, character's journey, and then they return and now we understand where they are that we saw in the beginning. Um, here's another question. Um, let's see. So Wendy asks, how would you go about expanding a short story to a novel or novella? Uh, that's always been the case with me. Always have ex expanded a short story into um, a novel. And so it, 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 it's a, no, not, a short story is its own little self-contained world. But often at the end of a short story, there's a kind of a question, like where... So where does this go? You know, the, the, there's a, like a hair that keeps sticking up or a cowlick, you know, that won't stay down. Um, you know, what happens to these people after this event um, is a way to open it up. And uh, in other, another book that I wrote um, in Paint It Black, um, I started my... The short story was the sort of the climax of the book. So then I had, I went back and asked myself, you know, who are these people? Who's my protagonist? I mean, which are my character, which are those characters are, is the protagonist? Uh, that took some writing and throwing out and stuff and finally realizing that it would be Josie Tyrell, a single protagonist. And so I knew her boyfriend committed suicide and that kicked off the whole story. So my next question is, how do you set up a scene where you have somebody who you love who kills himself? Do I want that scene? Do I want to be in the room when he does it? You know, how do I want to introduce that? And because it's not his story, I didn't want that scene to begin the story. I wanted to show, and I generally like to show people's lives before the, before the, you know, the support gets kicked out from under them. I like to show the, what is it usually like with them. So I started with her working, she's an art model, so I have her working 
And she's thinking, because she's sitting still, right? And I have her thinking about a, her boyfriend has not been acting very well, and she's kind of worried about it. But she's also hiding from herself her real fear about his emotional state and also giving you a sense of what, where we are, when we are. So it's set in punk rock LA, 1980. Um, so Christmas, it's John Lennon's just been shot. Darby Crash of the Germs uh, just killed, was killed. Um, so it's a, it, it, it foreshadows the doom and gloom of what's about to happen to her own personal life. But it's one thing to think about death at a remove, and then when it happens, that's a whole different trip. So we have the unease of the deaths and opinions, in ill-informed opinions about death. And then by the end of that chapter, she finds out about her boyfriend and then it comes it all comes home so then i started so i start there was a story about the confrontation the mother and uh, the boy's mother and the girlfriend the short story was in the mother's house and this weird kind of transformation where the girl becomes the boy it was a real gothic little story so that was my beginning. Then I go to the death of the boy is where we start getting to know the girl. And then knowing that this is going to happen, I know that there's going to be conflict between the mother and the, the girlfriend. Um, and I know somehow that girl is going to go back to the house where in the short story, the boy committed suicide, he didn't, didn't commit suicide there in the, uh, um, in the novel, I had it in a different place. And then, you know, work my way back towards that climax, which changed because everything changes as you're writing it and you're learning more about your story than you knew before. And then I got to where the story was, that short story piece. Everything had changed about it, not everything. Many things had changed about it. And then that wasn't the ending. And then I had to just continue to work out the problem until I got to a solution that satisfied me and resonated back through the book. And, you know, um, so I grew it both ways. Um, but usually that's how I work is expanding a short story into a longer work. Um, so it's asking yourself questions. How did I get here? How did they get there? Who are these people? Um, uh, let's see. Oh, those are all my questions. Um, but the, the middle is, people are always calling it the boring middle, but this is where you find out about your story is in the middle. Um, you know, as you're working toward all those changes, you know, you, I'm not somebody who can plot. I have a sense of the people, the kind of problem it is, the arena of the conflict, you know, so I knew certain things about it. I know the character's vulnerability and weaknesses and what kind of pressure is being applied to them. And then the solution, the ending, which I never have the ending, so that's this person is way ahead of me. Um, I'm looking for, at a certain point, I'm looking for the story to start closing in rather than expanding, expanding, expanding. At a certain point, you've got to start pulling the, the like the closure on a purse, you know, the, you pull the cord and it starts to close in. And the issues that were raised at the beginning, then we know how that played out and how the secondary stories fit in with the major story, you know, and how, because 
usually the secondary stories will support that final big rope, that final end, uh, and what actually happens that will prove a point about life, about how you think life goes. Um, like, you know, look at Anna Karenina. Um, it doesn't end with Anna Karenina's death, which she throws herself in front of a train because she can't deal with the repercussions, societal repercussions of her choice to abandon her family for a lover who is not, who's no genius and doesn't really understand her enough to help. Um, and there's another, there's another section after that, which people always forget. They remember the climax, the death of Anna Karenina. They never remember that there's a whole more section where people who have survived her, her brother who had an affair just like hers, but being a man, it didn't, it didn't hurt him. It hurt him some, but not, you know, it wasn't fatal. Um, and another young man who is in a relationship that is trying to be a happy family. Um, and we see how the living kind of step over the body of this tragic woman and keep going, which is the, the great tragedy of the novel, is that she died and life went on. So that deepens the that deepens the ending. It deepens the story. So Linda says, do short stories follow the same template? Absolutely not. Short stories are probably more varied than any other kind of writing. Um, they can be a look at the mystery. They can be linear narrative. They can be impressionistic. They can be. Um, more artful than, I mean, a longer work has to sustain interest over a long period of time. They, and, a, a, you know, a novel has to st sustain interest at least through, I mean, how long does it take to read a novel? You know, 15 hours, 30 hours, however many hours. Um, so it has to have a lot more ballast. It has to have, um, many elements that sustain interest. Whereas a short story, it can just be an impression. It can be a brushstroke. It can be like wild imagination that you wouldn't be able to sustain for um, 400 pages. Um, so I think that short story is, can be more innovative. It can be uh, more, um, more eccentric. Um, it just has to be really interesting and it's very intense and short. Um, so Linda says, I'm glad you said that um, because they often seem open-ended to me. Yeah, they, uh, a, a contemporary short story doesn't get nailed down. You know, it's not O. Henry. Um, it's often gives you a s slight sense of the world to come, you know, what what's gonna so it sometimes narrows down and makes a little makes its point very lightly and then it, it seems to open up a little bit at the end um and there are many short stories i'm I, as a i'm not always sure when i've read a short story of what really happened the first time i read it it's like what Often you finish a short story, you, you, you start it over again, going, did I miss something? And you pick things up that you missed the first time, and it starts to make more sense. Second reading, third reading, fourth reading. Um, it is not, it's not as neat a package. Um, it's, it's they can be, short stories can be quite challenging uh, for that reason. So Wendy says, there always seems to be a lull in the last third of a novel. Well, that's not good. <laughs> no, you don't want there to be a 
lull in the last third of a novel. You know, often there there can be a lull in the middle where you, uh, you know, you're working to make that little machine go and there might be a point of indecision where the writer isn't as forceful as they've been in the rest of the book. And the reader picks that up. That's not good. Um, you really try to, I mean, I, I always say um, to my early read, I have a clean reader. I have a woman who I save and she never sees the book until I'm done. And then I give, let her have a read. And I tell her, any place you put, put mark wherever you put it down for the night, whether you fell asleep, whether you got up and got a sandwich, you know, wherever you put it down, just mark. You know, stopped here, stopped here. And then you go in and you question those places. Like, why, why is that a place, a natural place to get up and stop reading it? Because you don't want that. You want to keep reading it. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for joining me for Writing Wednesday. And feel free to write your, send me your questions. Um, uh, there is a um, reading tomorrow uh, at a new bookstore in near the airport on the west side of Los Angeles, where I'm living. Um, uh, with a um, Czech, Czech American poet, um, uh, Lucian Zell, and uh, uh, American poet Peggy Dobreer, who I work with. Uh, I do morning meditations, and she works with me when I do my intensives. And so if you're in L.A., it's called The Book Jewel, it's, uh, and the reading is tomorrow night um, on the west side. I believe it is... Um, I think it's a seven o'clock reading. Uh, and that, that should be a lot of fun with Jerry Fialka, uh, who did recently did an interview with me that was the most fun I have had in years. This guy is an amazing interviewer. So Jerry Fialka with the G. Um, and I'll put a link to it in the, um, uh, in the comments in case you want to see that reading tomorrow evening at the book jewel on the west side and uh, we'll see you next week for writing wednesday thanks <laughs>